What up guys, Cole here, and this training is gonna be on creating the ultimate sales machine. And as you can see on the screen, um, another way to put that is building a sales flow that runs on autopilot. So to give you context, right now, our sales team's on pace for 2.6 million this month. And I have very, very minimal interface and input with my sales team at all. I'm not gonna say it runs completely on autopilot, but it is pretty doggone close. So it's semi-autopilot and it's a multiple eight figure sales team, which for a lot of entrepreneurs is the dream, right? They don't wanna be micromanaging a sales team and having to onboard and train every single sales rep that comes on, but instead they want something that can make sales day in and day out, great day-to-day -day sales, and then allows them to work on their business, not be sucked inside of the business. So we're gonna talk about how to do that in this training. So as you can see on the screen, uh, what we're gonna cover is beginning with the end in mind, putting your high ticket sales team on autopilot, the importance of having proper sequence, because as you'll see in this, most people try to skip steps. And it's very, very important you go in a specific order to be able to get the result here. And then we're also gonna talk about identifying when you're ready for a sales manager. Many people do that too early, so it's a big mistake. Then once you are ready, how to train the sales manager and how to transition leadership over to the sales manager. And we'll finally go over some sales manager SOPs. Now, before we get into this, if you want this document, comment doc in the YouTube comments below and we will get this to you ASAP. So just comment doc below and somebody from my team will just send you this, uh, this Google Doc link in the chat. Now, let's begin with that in mind. What are we here to build and what is this training ultimately going to lead you to? Well, it's really having a high performing sales team on autopilot. So uh, we're not going to get there immediately, but eventually if you have a high ticket business, your aim should be for the sales department of the business to run on autopilot without you having to constantly pour attention, time, and energy into it. So my sales team regularly produces anywhere from 60 to 200 grand a day. I think last Friday we produced 225 grand in a single day. And that's not off any launches. That's not off of, you know, promotions or anything. I mean, these are evergreen day-to-day -day sales that come in like clockwork no matter what, okay? And without, you know, as you'll see, I have a little bit of input, but for the most part, I'm completely removed from the day-to-day -day of actually managing and being a part of that team. Okay. Now, obviously I didn't get there, um, you know, instantly there was a sequence and a process, which you're going to learn in this video that I took and other people who have been my clients who've done the same thing and took as well. So where we eventually want to get to, once we can kind of get out of the day to day sales is really the point where you are, um, almost like chief product officer and eventually kind of like the rainmaker. And what I mean by that is your main responsibility is going to be once you're out of it to just keep calendars full at all costs and also work on positioning and the messaging in the marketing plays, kind of seeing what the trends are and making sure you're staying, uh, staying ahead of that and positioning yourself around it. And then of course, building and training your executive leadership team, leading through that team to lead the rest of the team and refining your product, refining your back end, and making sure those are good as well. Which obviously, those aren't things you're stuck with forever either. As you develop those skill sets, you can transfer those off to the executive team and then really be a CEO to where your main role is just to lead that team. And then eventually, uh, you can hire a CEO. I'm not there yet, but that's kind of the vision here. So let's talk about the proper sequence. Um, that end destination, right? Having you know 100 grand a day in sales come in uh, repeatedly, day in, day out, evergreen, it's pretty great, especially if you don't have to be a huge part of it. It's all what we want, but we can't jump there immediately. We have to do things in the proper sequence. There's a proper order to it. So the biggest mistake I see is what I call this pendulum swing. And essentially, you know, we help uh, entrepreneurs hire, you know, anywhere from our, you know, early company who works with us might be doing 30 to 40 grand a month of doing all the sales themselves. Our top company has 1.5 billion a year, has a huge sales floor. So uh, we work with a wide variety of range of people, but a lot of folks will come to us uh, when they're trying to hire their very first sales rep and they're the founder and they're doing all the sales themselves. And what happens when they finally, like we help them get the sales rep and the sales rep performing, what they do is what's called this pendulum swing where they just went from being totally into the sales and they were doing everything to it's like pendulum swing. I don't want any part of it. Like I don't, I don't want to put any input, any visibility whatsoever. They're just so happy to be off calls, be out of the sales process that they just don't put any energy, attention, and time into the sales team. Huge mistake. Because even if the sales rep performs in the very, very beginning, salespeople, unlike a automated funnel or something like that, they need constant nurturing energy and they need inputs. You gotta put stuff, energy into the sales team to get energy out. So the biggest mistake I see is, um, 
them doing this pendulum swing, and then also at the same time, just wanting nothing to do with the sales management. And this is very similar to, um, you know, if it, it would be very silly, and most people understand this, for you to have never sold your product or service ever, right? Like you've never even sold it, it's unvalidated, but then for you to hire a sales rep to go sell something you've never even sold. Right? Now that can work in some industries and in some circumstances. If maybe you can go out to a company who's really experienced, poach the VP of sales, have them come in. They've had you know, experience with these product lines before. Okay, certain stuff like that could happen. But for a lot of our clients, coaches, consultants, infopreneurs, agencies, um, that type of being able to go out there and get somebody as a VP of sales who's experienced and has done this and can I kind of build out the whole sales program, it's very, very hard. And by the way, if you're gonna do that, you're probably gonna to have to give them equity or some sort of rev share anyways, right? I mean, they're taking on a whole lot of responsibility and a whole lot of risk. So um, most times people, they just don't want anything to do with the sales management and very, very similar to the sales calls, you gotta kind of master selling your own product or service before you can transfer it to somebody else. Well, the same things with sales management. You have to build the skills and master sales management before you transfer that to somebody else. Now. It's kind of weird. People will, they're willing to, to uh, master the sales calls. They understand that. But then once they're off, they don't want a part of the sales management. So I know I just harped on this a lot. I'm kind of like going on a little bit of rain here, but I guess can't tell you how important that is. Like you really, once you're off calls, you have to embody building the skill set of proper sales management. Because as you'll see later, the key is going to be grooming the sales reps internally to be able to take over and eventually be the sales manager. So most people want nothing to do with it. Another mistake is, is they do it if they, you know, they do hire one, they do it too soon. Um, I'll just say I've been a part of the past couple of years of coaching 450 plus high ticket sales teams. I've only seen somebody bring in an external sales manager to take over successfully two times, literally two times. Uh, one of them was Tony Robbins, who's one of our clients. And, um, you know, with a brand name like that, you have such recruiting power um, that that's kind of an exception. And then the other one um, brought in an external sales manager, but man, it was just, they, they hit on all cylinders. They found the perfect person. This person, it was a music industry offer. This person had experience in the music industry and also high ticket sales. It was kind of a very, very rare unicorn situation. He did very good. Now, aside from those two circumstances, I've seen a lot more people, dozens and dozens of tr people try to bring on an external sales manager Statistically, what I have found is it fails, okay? And I'm just telling you that I've had very, very many people we've helped and I've seen you know, hundreds of these, uh, of these examples and there's a high statistical significance that bringing on external sales managers, at least in our industry, does not work, okay? So again, we wanna groom them internally. That's what we're gonna talk about in this training, but I just wanna get over that. So um, we covered a lot of this, so let's move on to the proper sequence here. So what we're gonna go through is the proper sequence, the steps of going from zero, right, to where you're just starting off in your company, which I know a lot of people watching this video are probably past that, but I think for context, it helps to start there. From zero to pretty much where we are right now, where you can have your sales team running on autopilot, doing eight figures, multiple eight figures, with you have, with, without you having to be a part of it, okay? So the first step of that is validating your offer. So uh, again, most people probably watching this video are past this stage, but it's always gonna be the first step, which means your deliverables, package, packaging, messaging have to be clearly mapped out um, and people are consistently buying it, okay? And buying the same thing, right? So you've at least made about five to 10 sales of the same package message offer. Okay, this doesn't mean if you're a full service agency and you're doing you know, 10 different things for 10 different people, you really don't have a validated offer, right? You have to have a clear package and you're consistently selling that clear package. So at this stage, most folks, at least in our industry, are doing some organic. Uh, they're doing this selling themselves. They're doing a good bit of fulfillment themselves. And uh, you know, this is, can be anywhere from you know zero to 20 to 30K a month, or sometimes even, maybe even bigger than that, 50, 70K a month sometimes. Now, step number two is validating your optimal selling system. So Optimal selling system is a term I got from Mark Ford from his book, Ready, Fire, Aim, which is the best business book I've ever read. And um, essentially what this is, at least my definition of it, um, is a customer acquisition system that fits two key criteria. One is a consistent, repeatable, scalable way to turn cold prospects into sales calls, okay? So the first criteria is a consistent, repeatable, and scalable way to turn cold prospects into sales calls. The second criteria 
is a consistent, repeatable, scalable way to turn the sales calls into clients, right? That's it. So two consistent, scalable, repeatable ways to turn one, cold prospects into sales calls, and two, sales calls into clients. That's it, okay? Most people think they have this, but they do not, okay? And I put here, just for this one, this is the one people kind of trip up on. I think people understand um, you need to have a repeatable sales process. Like when you're on the sales calls, that needs to be repeatable. A lot of people don't really get um, the repeatable uh, at lead acquisition, right, of generating sales calls. So, um, and I'll give credit to Alex Hormozzi on this. He talks about the six main methods of acquisition. There's own media, earned media, word of mouth, paid, affiliate, and outbound, okay? So you have to get one of these channels repeatable and scalable. Now, in the coaching, consulting, and agency, infopreneurship type of industry, typically, it's gonna be one of two. It's either gonna be manual outbound or paid. Okay. Now, if you're running SaaS, if you know, there's there's so many different industries and business models out there to where it's certainly you could have an a scalable scalable model all through affiliates, a scalable model all through word of mouth, uh, owned media, earned media. But most times with our clients, and I've had a lot of them at the eight figure, multi eight figure level, what they've mastered is either scalable outbound or scalable paid, and really the high majority is scalable paid. Okay. So. Um, not that any of the others don't work, but typically we want to master one of those. Now, a few key things here is, again, most people think they kind of have this mastered, but the key is that you have the system, and this is why the outbound and the uh, paid work so well, you have a system where the inputs equal or highly correlated to the outputs, okay? So what that means is like ads is a great example, right? Let's say you have your ads, they're validated, they're running in KPI. If you're spending $1,000 on ads and getting X, Y, and Z results, okay? Well, if you spend $2,000 on ads, you should see a, you know, not maybe not a 2X increase, but a 1.8X increase because you're gonna, maybe gonna be paying a little bit more of a premium through the increased ad, ad costs and the CPMs, okay? Same thing with manual outbound. If you have Two, two setters or two uh, SDRs who are generating, let's say, 15 sales calls a week apiece, so 30 sales calls a week total. If you add two more and they get within KPI, you should double the results given you actually give them the same amount of data and the opportunity, et cetera. Right? So you see how with those two systems, the inputs are very highly correlated to the outputs. Now, the reason that is really important is because as you'll see with building a sales team, it's very, very important that we can pull the lever and be able to predictably fill another sales calendar. That's how we're gonna scale our sales team really fast. And where people get tripped up is they're maybe doing a little bit of organic, they have kind of like a YouTube channel, they got a little TikTok over here. It's very kind of all over the place and inconsistent, and they can provide one sales calendar worth, but it's not as easy as being able to provide that second, third sales calendar and scale repeatedly and consistently. And then also, if you're highly organic coming from, you know, word of mouth, a networking event, some are coming from like a little bit of Facebook organic, some are coming from YouTube, what happens then is the context of which the leads are coming in is different. And that does make it a little bit harder for the sales team to have their repeatable process, which brings me to the second one. And so you want the, the lead acquisition process to be consistent, repeatable, scalable, inputs, outputs. Same with the sales process. Most founders, because they, they're experts in what they do, they're a little bit more charismatic, they have high amounts of certainty in what they do, they kind of wing it without any sort of repeatable process, okay? You have to really refine it down and really get like a repeatable sales process of turning that sales call into a client. Um, and you gotta make sure that works on cold traffic. So this is very, very, very important here is we'll see founders come in and they're like, dude, I'm closing 84%, offers totally validated, la da 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 but it's all you know, referrals, word of mouth, warm traffic, or like affiliates or something. And then they launch cold traffic, bring on a sales team, and they're like, well, why is my sales team converting 15%? Well, look, you just changed two variables, right? You went from closing warm people with a sales process to now the sales process closing cold people, and then on top of that, the lead acquisition is totally different. So you're changing too many variables at once. And what we really wanna do is we wanna create the conveyor belt. It's meaning, what you should do is first, get the cold traffic thing, whether that's manual outbound or paid, dialed in. And then once that's dialed in, you need to make sure you're able to convert those people as the founder, right? Because 
if you throw a salesperson into a whole new lead acquisition system that's cold and they're not converting, they're going to have no idea if it's them or the lead acquisition process, if that makes sense. So we wanna get that validated and then get the founder to sell at least five to 15 of those at the minimum. And then once the conveyor belt is working, they can take themselves out and put in a salesperson. Now we've only changed one variable. So everything is isolated, which we're gonna talk about this in a second, but you really should hire two salespeople, not one, which brings us to step number three. So again, once everything's working like a conveyor belt, we're gonna to wanna to remove ourselves from the sales process. So we've already had a validated offer, validated lead flow, validated sales process. So everything's like a conveyor belt, we're moving one variable, putting a sales rep in. So I would at this point recommend hiring two people at once, okay? Because um, even if you are changing one variable, you should have things isolated. It does really help in our experience to hire two people so you can compare it. Because if both of them don't perform and they both looked really good previously, it could be something going on with how you're training them, how you're leading them, how you're kind of transferring over the sales skill set to them. Maybe it's the sales process isn't repeatable as you thought it was. But oftentimes what will happen is one of them will work or and one of them won't. Or because you have them competing against each other and there's a survival of fitness going on, they both actually perform better than if you would have hired them individually. So the success rate is much higher. Now, the big caveat with this is that if you hire two, you have to be able to provide the leads for two, which is again why that point number one about having the uh, consistent and scalable lead acquisition is so important. Because if let's say you got like the organic and it's it's kind of inconsistent, you have enough for one salespeople, but it's not predictable into, to where you could fill two calendars, what's gonna happen is sometimes both of them are gonna work out and you're not gonna be able to fill both of their calendars. So both of them are gonna have mediocre calendars and then you're gonna churn. So in that case, if you are in that in inconsistent phase, doesn't mean you can't hire a sales rep, it just has to be uh, probably just one, right? But preferably you have that lever you can pull to where if they both work out, you can keep both of them. And then when you wanna add that third sales rep, you hire two, same thing, all right? See what I mean? This is why it's so important to have um, a consistent and repeatable lead acquisition that it's very, very easier to add more inputs and get more outputs and be able to fill an additional calendar um, predictably, if that makes sense. Now, let's get into step number four. So now that you're, as the founder, removed from sales, you're gonna take on the role as a sales manager. So don't leave this, um, again, like don't leave. Once you get out of sales, don't just leave it to your sales reps, kind of cross your fingers uh, and hope they perform, okay? Uh, if you really wanna have a high performance sales team, that is not going to happen. There's no sales team out there that's super high performance, that has no management, no training, no coaching whatsoever. There's no sports team out there that has no coach, no you know training, management, anything that is a high performing team, right? Every great team has a coach and a leader and now is your time to be that person. So the easiest way to understand this is we're gonna look at all of the sales manager-esque responsibilities and we're gonna break it down into three categories so you know exactly what's expected of you. And then what I'm gonna show you how to do is how to um, systematically basically offload those categories onto new hires until you're not doing anything, okay? You'll see what I mean in a second. So there's three core responsibilities of the sales manager. There's coaching and training responsibilities, there's admin and ops responsibilities, and there's leadership responsibilities. So. Coaching and training responsibilities means doing morning meetings, running projections, training and call reviews, doing Q&A and questions, answers, scenarios, everything like that with the sales team. It's also doing role plays, drilling, stuff like that. Should be done every single morning daily. Then there's one-on-one -on -one calls. So when people are onboarding for the first two to three weeks, you wanna have at least two to three one-on-ones, 30 minute long a week. Then after that, if you are a full-time sales manager, weekly. Okay, if you're a founder and you're like, man, I can't do weekly, I just have like literally no time, then bi-weekly minimum. If you can do weekly, still do weekly. It's so, so important. Then end of day reports. Um, this end of day reports is kind of beyond the scope of this training. This is basically a qualitative assessment. We have our sales reps report at the end of the day, every single day. We wanna make sure they're reading, commenting, coaching on all of them. And then based on the report, Typically what we find works best is a five to 10 minute call if necessary to give them any coaching based on what the reps struggle with that day. And then also having them do call reviews. They can be on the meetings, off the meetings, typically 
two to three a week when they're first ramping, and then one a week at least thereafter, if not more, okay? So that's the coaching and training responsibilities. Now we're moving on to admin and ops responsibilities. So this is grading, approving, or removing applications that are coming in. So just kind of delegating the leads to the sales team and then also determining what's a MQL, which basically means a marketing qualified lead. So we're generating a lot of applications through paid, but then our sales coordinator who does these admin and ops, we'll talk about sales coordinators in a second, they're determining what's an MQL which is a marketing qualified lead, and what are we gonna move to a setter to requalify, or what are we just gonna cancel, where we're not gonna accept. So they're also gonna work with attribution, understanding what closes came from where, what appointments came from where. They're gonna communicate uh, calendar availability to the marketing department, so there's a lazy on between marketing and sales. They're going to make sure the closers do their admin. We all know closers love doing their admin, just kidding. Um, they're going to maintain accuracy of the tracking dashboard, making sure all the reporting is, uh, is in line, is accurate. And um, they're going to integrate that reporting and make sure there's consistent consistency between the marketing dashboard reporting and the sales reporting, because most times there's not. Um, marketing tends to over-report, sales tends to under-report. Now, the final responsibility of the sales manager is leadership. Okay, and this is mainly gonna occur on the meetings where it's communicating vision, mission, and values, holding people accountable, doing projections, and uh, you know, doing, you can do some sales training, some role plays, even with the founder in a meeting, okay? So, when you first take over, you gotta do all of this stuff. Now, the key is, very quickly, we're gonna offload one of these three categories. You're gonna see which right now. So, that's step five. Is step five is hiring what's called a sales coordinator, or just having your op, uh, an existing operations person or EA absorb those sales coordinator responsibilities. So basically, what is a sales coordinator or you know, what, is that, what are those types of responsibilities? All of this admin and ops stuff, instantly we're gonna absorb into somebody else, okay? So right away, you had these three responsibilities. I would never recommend any founder doing this stuff that I've highlighted on the screen, don't do it have an operations person absorb that, okay? Um, I wouldn't recommend, you typically don't need a full-time sales coordinator for this stuff until you're probably multiple eight figures, but um, usually I, I recommend people have their EA or existing ops person absorb it. So right then and there, now you as the founder, you're just down to coaching and training and leadership, okay? So then the next step, is gonna be offloading another one of those responsibilities. And that's step six, which is identifying your sales lead, okay? So once you get to about three to four total salespeople, regardless if they're outbound or inbound, you're gonna to wanna to start to identify who's your sales lead. And basically this is an A player closer, um, or it could be an A player setter for your team if you wanna have two leads, okay? And this person is gonna take over all the coaching and training responsibilities. They're gonna do all the one-on-ones, especially the one-on-ones during um, onboarding and training. So you might do like kind of the bi-weekly one-on-ones thereafter still, but like the first initial couple one-on-ones a week, they're gonna do those. They're gonna help lead meetings. They're gonna do separate breakout rooms. So, you know, you'll do a breakout room on Zoom. You take part of the team. They take part of the team. It's kind of tag team call reviews. Uh, they're gonna comment on the end of day reports. They're gonna do call reviews on the meetings, outside of the meetings, and they're also gonna take calls. So very, very key here, the sales lead is a player coach, player coach, okay? And the majority, like 98% of their income should still, some, uh, still come from selling, okay? So don't confuse this person with, oh, I need to offload all this managerial stuff on them. Nah, you know, they're gonna be helping, but you're still technically the manager, okay? But this drastically helps, okay? I mean, because a lot of these responsibilities are the tedious, repeatable ones, you know, having reps, shadow calls, things like that. And it's really great once you can get rid of these because now you're down to just this. You're down to just running the meetings, which typically in our meetings we do announcements, projections. Then after we go through projections, then we'll do a training or we'll do a call review or we'll do a role play and we'll drill, depending on kind of what we feel like is needed in the moment or we'll do a combination of all of those. So now you're down in the meetings or maybe an hour a day tops. So now you went from all this stuff down to an hour a day. And that's where you wanna to get to as fast as possible. And then typically we see people hold onto that until they hit about the eight figure level, right? Or at the very least, six, seven million a year, probably around there. So what's really key here is um, 
this person's kind of helping you onboard people. The new people are shadowing this person. They're helping kind of do some call reviews here and there, but it's not drastically taking away from their day-to-day -day sales. Like they should not be making significantly less or really anything less at all. Like they should be kind of be able to juggle some hats here. And then it's up to you if you want to disclose this to your sales leads or not, but really what your sales leads are, are the managers in training, right? It's a great way to kind of trial before you hire out or hire and promote the manager here. Now, in terms of pay, everybody asks about this. You can do a small kind of base, one to 2K a month, if you want to, roll, roll, roll light. Um, or, you know, especially if it's uh, communicated that this is a sales manager in training type of thing, right, to where they're gonna prove themselves that they're okay for leadership, then you don't have to pay them anything, right? It's kind of almost like a tryout. And a lot of people will like this position regardless because it gives them this recognition. Like they, they wanna be seen as a leader amongst all of their peers anyways. Now, before we move on on this one, Really, really important. You still got to do the following. You still got to do the morning meetings and the day reports and um, trainings during the morning meetings. But you basically condense all your stuff down to an hour a day because you got the sales coordinator, your admin person doing the operational stuff. You have your lead doing a lot of the coaching training and you're just focused on that meeting a day, which is very, very, very scalable. Like, believe me, it's worth spending an hour a day on the only department of your business that actually takes the customer's money. Right, that is a very high leverage thing to do. So I did that until probably about a month or two ago. And we were over 2 million a month in sales at that point with about eight salespeople. So I um, highly recommend you do that. Now, moving lead into management. So at this stage, your lead, your sales lead should have significant experience and you should be relatively certain they're going to crush it as a manager. And typically revenue wise, you're at about maybe 500 to 800,000 a month. And um, sales rep wise, typically around four to six closers minimum. Okay, and you might be at four to six setters too. So you might have over 10 people. So, and then at that point, you probably wanna have two leads and then you promote the closer lead to manager and then you keep the setter lead. Okay, so the reason these ranges are kind of ambiguous is because it depends on the, the product, right? If um, for instance, like on the early side, I've seen people at $350,000 a month remove themselves from the sales management, but they were selling something that was 3,800 and they had six closers. So there's a lot of complexity there. Whereas at the, at the far side, I've seen, I used to be a part of a team where we didn't really even have a sales manager until you know 1.2, 1.3 million a month. And the reason for that is because me and this other guy were really, really good. And we just, I mean, that 1.2 was just us. Like, we, you know, I was doing half, he was doing about the other half. So there was really no need for a sales manager because the complexity wasn't very high, right? So it kind of depends on personnel and also on revenue. I mean, the main reason for revenue is because the sales manager is gonna be expensive. You're gonna wanna tie them to cash collected percentage and it needs to be high enough to where it kind of makes sense. Otherwise, if you start it off too low to be able to pay them what they're worth, you're gonna have to give them a higher percentage and as that scales, it'll be uneconomical on your profit. So, or on your uh, P&L, which means low profit. So you just gotta watch out for that. Now, once you are ready though, and you've hit kind of those metrics, then, um, and at this point also, you should, the last thing you should be doing is in daily meetings, how do you transition the sales lead in where you promote them the manager, and then you slowly transition off of meetings. So let's say you're doing five meetings a week, right? You're doing the daily meeting, you, you go down to three. So Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Then pretty quickly, you go down to two, and then you go down to just Mondays. I would hold on to just Mondays for a while. And then, I mean, if it's not necessary, go every other Monday. And then eventually at the very, very least, the first Monday of every single month. Um, personally, I think uh, it's still so high leverage to at least just do every Monday. Uh, it's an hour of your week spending with the most important department of your entire business. Maybe you could argue marketing is, but still really the important department of your business. I would still do Mondays and then hold on for Mondays just a bit. But if at a certain point your manager is crushing and they can really communicate the vision and motivate, then uh, you can transition even more out of that. So 